This is the Roswell Thesis by Mac Ralston. And remember, don't listen before bed. On the seventh day of July in 1947, the Walker Air Force Base, or Roswell Army Airfield, recovered what appeared to be, in their words, a flying saucer from a ranch in Chaves County, New Mexico. The rancher in question, a William Mack Brazel, found a cluster of, as the report states, rubber strips, tinfoil, a rather tough paper, sticks, and tape. The materials were confiscated and brought to the military base. The following day, July 8th, a press release was issued, stating the materials were that of a flying disc. However, this report was quickly retracted, exchanged for favorable evidence of a crashed weather balloon. The reasoning for this change is unknown, however, theories attempt to fill in the blanks. One speculation suggests that the report of such a discovery would lead to mass hysteria, akin to the Orson Welles broadcast of the late 30s. Even so, this claim has never been addressed by officials publicly. Despite Mac Brazel's conflicting words, his side of the story was quickly dropped, and the weather balloon explanation was hailed as the case-closed resolution to what occurred on July 7th. Resurfacing in the late 70s, and again in 1994, the story of Roswell was altered with claims of UFOs and an alternative hypothesis to the weather balloon, that being a nuclear surveillance balloon from Project Mogul, an operation helmed by the U.S. Air Force to detect Soviet atomic blasts. Furthermore, any eyewitness reports of alien bodies being retrieved from the nearby area were chalked up as Air Force test dummies, and the story was dropped again. Being left up to the imaginations of conspiracy theorists and ufologists alike, the Roswell incident has become somewhat of a joke over the last 30 or so years, sparking pop culture depictions of aliens and UFOs, often tongue-in-cheek in nature, and treating those who believe the claims to be about as sane as flat earthers. There is, however, another notion that has been floating around for the past 50 or so years. This one is far more complicated, but nevertheless, more competent. Known as the Roswell Thesis, the premise starts as follows. A common ground between deniers and so-called truthers alike. The object received on July 7, 1947, in Roswell, New Mexico, was a balloon. Whether from Project Mogul or a mere weather balloon is irrelevant. The reported bodies were merely dummies, and the entire thing was not a crashed UFO cover-up. It's from here where the theory takes a sharp turn from the norm. As according to the thesis, the claims from Roswell and likewise those from other UFO incidents from around the globe are merely fabrications made by extraterrestrials. Consider it for a moment. Would these advanced otherworldly entities from the outer regions of space blunder in such a way, enact such an oversight that would cause their voyeurism to go blatantly noticed by the residents of our planet? Does the low-flying and obvious nature of reported UFOs seem utterly convenient? Does a spacecraft made of paper, tinfoil, and tape seem archaic? Do the sightings of little green men or crop circles strike you as glaring oxymorons to the alleged cryptic nature of these alien beings? The thesis is, in essence, a conspiracy of conspiracies. The idea is that, yes, the Roswell incident as well as other alleged alien sightings are hoaxes. However, the threat of extraterrestrial beings is still imminent. In 
fact, the theory suggests we're already too late to act against their invasion. There is a preconceived notion as to what an alien invasion looks like, whether from mentally ill truthers or science fiction films and literature. However, the truth is often a departure from fictitious propaganda, and yet at the same time the truth is hidden within these myths. On the night of September 19, 1961, at approximately 10.30 p.m., Barney and Betty Hill, residents of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, claimed to have been abducted by extraterrestrials while driving home from vacation. The couple reported seeing a UFO hovering over their vehicle and immediately began speeding home, where they reported feelings of impulse and odd sensations including vivid dreams of gray-skinned creatures and metal discs. The vehicle they sped home in had noticeable circles etched in a metallic substance along the trunk. Moving a compass near the symbols caused the needle to berserk. Betty Hill also noted a pinkish powder-like substance stained on her dress. Later, under hypnosis, Betty would describe a hologram shown to her of the extraterrestrial's homeworld, the binary star system known as Zeta Reticuli. According to journalist Cortland Dixon Barnes Bryan, 73% of all alleged alien sightings refer to these Zeta Reticulons, also known as the Greys. While these accounts have bits of truth sprinkled throughout, the theory suggests much of the abduction was carried out to seem fictitious, as if purposeful. What we are dealing with are not simple-minded primitives, as humans assume, being ourselves somewhat primitive, despite our countless advancements. No. These entities are vastly more intelligent than us, realizing that the best way to invade is not by sheer force, ray guns, or War of the Worlds style walkers, but rather forcing our species into extinction through self-genocide. The first notions of this idea come from a 1966 autopsy of 44-year-old Conrad Dennison, a patient of the then-named New Mexico Hospital for the Insane. Today, this facility is known as the New Mexico Behavioral Health Institution, located in the town of Las Vegas, New Mexico. Denison has been, unfortunately, scrubbed from the records of the institution, as no mention of his name or symptoms is available in any forms or documents. His case, however, remains one of the cornerstones for the thesis. Admitted to the hospital in 65 as a schizophrenic, Dennison claimed to have been abducted by extraterrestrials. Reporting constant migraines and nightmares, Dennison was transferred to psychiatrist Eric Rolston, PhD. Rolston, who had a background in lobotomy, claimed that Dennison had a cyst on his frontal lobe, requiring surgery to remove it. After repeated sessions in which Dennison claimed to have seen pale, human-looking beings, he admitted to having killed his 42-year-old wife, Charlene Dennison. When asked where her body was located, Dennison claimed he didn't know because they were controlling me while I was asleep. Despite a confession to murder, the implications of insanity meant a lengthy trial, one that Dennison would never see. Months later, in the November of 1966, Conrad Dennison died due to complications with his lobotomy. During the operation, Rolston made note of a small organic glob attached to the frontal lobe. This glob, while organic, was unlike anything the hospital had ever seen. Undetected by x-rays, the cyst-like glob had been surgically attached to Dennison's brain. Although, the surgery that presumably attached it was theorized to be quite advanced, 
considering methods used in the 21st century are not capable of replicating the seamless precision of the transplant. Any further information regarding Conrad Dennison is unknown, as the files on his case were mysteriously removed from existence. Even stranger, perhaps, is that Conrad and Charlene's son, Kenny Dennison, conceived one year before Charlene's murder, and one year after the alleged abduction, was arrested in 1982 for robbing a convenience store. When approached by responding officers, Dennison drew a firearm and was killed on sight. During the autopsy, pathologists noted the same cyst-like glob on Kenny Dennison's frontal lobe as if, somehow, the implant was genetically passed down from Conrad to his son. Kenny's adoptive parents and name have been obscured for privacy reasons, but rumor has it the family was not violent and Kenny's behavior was quite unlike him. Violent crime rates have steadily increased over the past 50 years. While not genocide by a long shot, these outbursts are perhaps birthing pains for something to come, not driven by rage, malice, or envy, but mental illness. Illness that, in estimations, has been passed down by generations. Illness that has infected the mind. In a more recent turn of events, following an automobile accident in Springdale, Utah on April 19th of 2013, a 22-year-old college student, Sean Phillips, was arrested for violently stabbing the driver of the other vehicle. 77-year-old Nathan Moffat. Despite having no record of violence, Phillips was later found to be diagnosed with bipolar disorder at the Highland Ridge Psychiatric Treatment Center. Three weeks before the stabbing, Phillips' mother claimed he went missing for a period of two days, during which Phillips had lost cell signal. Upon his return home, Phillips couldn't recall where he had been, but noted occasional headaches and periodic outbursts of screaming. In an interview with Phillips' roommate at Highland Ridge, Phillips' erratic behavior was described as inhuman and weird. During one conversation, Phillips confided in his roommate, claiming the thin, gray people were in his head. Moments later, Phillips' roommate described Phillips' eyes as going dead before he lashed out at the fellow patient. Phillips would receive 13 therapy sessions before passing away in his room on December 23, 2013. As reported by his roommate, Phillips' final words were, Tell my mom I'm sorry. I didn't hurt that man. They made me do it. Phillips proceeded to suffocate himself with a pillow. These acts of self-harm are genuine. However, the instances and crimes that led to such atrocious suicides are not self-inflicted. Even more troublesome are in the cases in which the offender is subdued and harmed, many times killed by others. As this, fearfully, was the motive of the beings all along. Over the last decade, UFO sightings have decreased. While public interest in alien life will always remain stimulated, the shift from humanoid greys to bacterial water-based life on Mars has occurred, resulting in the intelligent Roswell-type aliens being largely classified as fiction. Some theorize that the reasoning for this change is a part of a larger plan, as in the minds of some theorists, the extraterrestrials at hand want nothing more than for their existence to be disregarded. Roswell was their idea. The UFOs may be theirs, but only toys, perhaps, so that their true nature might be tucked away. They're watching us all, for some in our heads, in our heads. and they want us to buy into the lie that they don't exist. 
It appears that even we, too, have been infiltrated. As the only way to discredit the theory is to treat it as ludicrous fiction, invalidating the truth and parading it as nonsense. You may be reading this thesis in a fiction-based catalog. Please consider that what you are reading is not fiction.